Round 14 was a tale of opportunity taken and opportunity lost, and it sets up the most important round of the season coming. It begins on Thursday night. So let's reflect with the Monday means test on all that transpired across the weekend and where it leaves us. Luke Hodge is in the chair for the means test. Luke, great to have you on board. Good morning, Jared. Good to be here. Uh, just hold up your left hand for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty crook sight. All right. So our opening gambit here to get us underway. Retired footballers should stay retired. Luke Hodge, tell us the story of your Saturday. Uh, I believe that's false, Jared. I reckon <laughs> um, footballers should be able to. Injuries are a part of the game, and yeah, it didn't go to, didn't go to plan. I um, went out and played for for Devon Meadows against Seaford. They were, um, it was a uh, they've both been in really good form this year, and yeah, I, in the third quarter, I uh, got a high free kick, and um, as I've looked down at my hand, I thought that doesn't feel right. And I've looked <laughs> down, and there's a little bit of bone sticking <laughs> out the uh, the part of the finger. So uh, I end up having a, a compound dislocated finger so had to leave there at three quarter time i did get a few comments over the fence of um get a bucket of cement and harden up um <laughs> someone heckled me and says i oh, know he won't be able to hold his microphone anymore um, so went down and had seven hours in uh, emergency in at uh, epworth in richmond and then had an operation and got home about twelve thirty that night so it was a, a fun saturday but um oh, look, i look i still had a ball um i went out and trained with them the thursday before it was. It took me back to Colic days, old school country football. Um, had everyone. There was a lot of people that turned up. Apologies to everyone who got there and wasn't able to fulfil the whole game. Um, but yeah, it, it seemed like um, yeah, a really good day out there. So uh, happy it all went apart. But unfortunately, <laughs> the team lost, and and I spent a few hours in hospital. Did Did you injure your calf in the warm up? Well, <laughs> I um. They, they did a longer warm-up than what I did in 18 years of AFL football. <laughs> so we went out and at, at uh, three-quarter time of the reserves, we went out for a bit of a kick, and I thought, that's okay. And then halfway through the last quarter of the reserves, we went out to the back paddock, and um, and I reckon I would have done about 5Ks in that warm-up, just back and forth, jumps, hops, skips. And then as I've ran out, I've felt a little something in the car, <laughs> in the calf. So I spent the first, I don't know, five minutes of the warm-up out in the ground, getting deep heat and a thumb through the calf. So... Um, it, it, it's pulled up okay, a little bit, little bit sore after the game, but nothing, nothing too bad. The, the finger was probably the <laughs> the biggest issue out of the day, but um, you live and learn, and hopefully in four to six weeks I can get back playing golf again. On a popularity scale of say one to ten, when you got home, uh, what was your what was your rating from your beautiful wife? Uh, Loz, well, first of all, I had to delay the flight, so we we're planning on going back um, Saturday night at nine o'clock and. I had to grab an 11 o'clock on Sunday. So getting back the next day wasn't ideal, but look, Loz understands what football's like um, <laughs> and she knows that I've had a few injuries over the journey. So she looked at me, laughed, and I think her first call was, um, at least we don't have a, a, a newborn to change change nappies. Last time I had operations on my hand was when our second son, Chase, was two weeks old and I got out of changing nappies for the first three months of his life. So um, no, she understood it was all a part of the game and... Um, she knows I do silly things like this. <laughs> so what you're telling part, me is game. when you're all healed up and the opportunity comes, you'll probably play another game at some point. 100%. <laughs> without, uh, oh, as I said, it, was, it reminded me of Colac days. It was old school football. There was people up there having fun. Um, the heckling was fun. Even the Seaford boys. I, I took a mark in the first quarter, went back about 40 out, and then passed it short to a bloke by himself in the pocket. And my teammate said... Blokes come out here to watch you kick goals, not pass them off. So it was all a no, no. It was, it was a good day, apart from the, uh, the the little injury. The little injury. The opening gambit with Luke Hodge. Uh, yes, it's a little bit the worse for wear. All right, so let's. There's a whole lot of categories for us today, Luke, to work through. Uh, let's just start with our debate. Where are we after round fourteen? In what feels like a historic squeeze? It's um, it's something over the last three weeks has made everything so interesting. You look at Melbourne, who's dropped form. You look at Gold Coast, who's won, I think, four out of the last five. Um, Essendon doing what they did on the weekend. It, it's You sort of sit back and, and from... There's three teams on 40 points, two teams on 36. There's four on 32. Um, and, yeah, you've got Gold Coast and Port playing each other this weekend. To, um, whoever loses that game, I think, is out of the finals race. But... This is, a, this is as big a round as we've had coming up. You've got yeah, one playing two, you've got four playing six, you've got seven playing eight, uh, and then you've got the other teams that are trying to hold on um, to, or, or to get into the final. So um, 
normally at this time of year that we've got someone who's jumping away. This is a pretty intriguing uh, round 14 for us. We have to, because Port Adelaide and the Suns play, we, we have to run it all the way to 12th, don't we? Yeah, we do. I'm sort of looking at it and I'm I'm sitting there thinking both have got both have got pretty tough draws coming up. So I'm almost putting a line at, at Western Bulldogs. Okay. Uh, I know that Gold Coast they've done an excellent job to get back but back in the running. Um, but Gold Coast Port playing each other. So obviously, clearly, whoever loses out of uh, out of those, I think, are out. But I'd probably put my my line around about the Bulldogs. Um, just with on 28 points, a good percentage. Um, where Gold Coast and, and Port of Port's obviously a game behind them with with 105 percent as well, so it, it is. It's an intriguing game for for both of those sides. And the notion of the slip up, so opportunity lost, and this was St Kilda. Um, Sydney lost to a team who may or may not be in the the rush, but St Kilda lost to a team who was in the bottom reaches. It's going to be hard enough to win the games around you. Is how costly are those slip-ups likely to be? Is that they're the ones that are really going to cause the heartburn on the run-in? Yeah, without a doubt. But look, I could you could see from the first bounce that St Kilda wasn't their normal self. I, uh, I commentated their game the previous week against the Lions. And they had two concussions, um, one in the second quarter, one early in the third. So they pretty much had three rotations for the third quarter. And then Zach Jones hurt his hamstring and he was out at three-quarter time. So they had two rotations for that whole last quarter. And I could see on their face, for the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes of that quarter against the Lions, you had blokes running off absolutely exhausted because they just hadn't had any breaks. And blokes were, were coming to the bench, were getting told to turn around. And they would continue to push because they were a couple of goals down. They need to move the ball fast to try and score against the Lions. But I, I saw that in hell St Kilda played this weekend, they they just looked leg dead. They looked flat. Plus a six day break coming back from from Brisbane uh, into a Friday night game. So, look, I, I, I've been there many times where you've you've worked your backside off the week before um, with limited rotations, a short break, and you just can't get things going. Um, and that's that's nothing taking nothing away from Essendon because they were they were outstanding. How big a marker is Thursday night, Met Melbourne and the Brisbane Lions, when the top two meets in round fifteen? Well. What, three weeks ago, you're probably sitting there going, well, Melbourne at home, there's no chance for the Lions. But as you see, teams have been able to identify Melbourne in a small, agile forward line. You, you saw what Frio, Sydney were able to do um, and just move the ball quick, work up, work back. The only thing with the Lions is they they, they go into this game with a different structure. They've got their proper team back as far as their, their key forwards with Danaher, Hitwood and Mick Stay. So that probably goes against... Um, the teams that have troubled Melbourne in the past with the, the agile small forward. So, look, I, there's no doubt the Lions are going to be going into into the game with a bit of with a bit of confidence, considering they've played some okay football. They've snuck up the first pretty much because of Melbourne have fallen off the perch. But um, it's going to be a, a, a big big game, just the fact on those two teams because Melbourne have caused Brisbane some troubles in the past. Their defensive pressure in the final last year, they demolished them, um, and then. The, uh, the year before, down when they played in Sydney with COVID, uh, their defensive structure in the second half just really shut the Lions down. So there's no doubt that's going to be a key for Melbourne. Shut the Lions ball, ball pressure down, keep the ball in our half. Um, and, yeah, see how they go. We're in the Monday means test from round 14 where the big issue is Jordan Degoe. It's the big issue that faces Collingwood today. There's all sorts of layers to this. Degoe himself, Collingwood's leadership group, the Magpies administration – the AFL, and then the public debate around it. Luke, you run our leadership portfolio on this on this program. Just give me your overall thoughts before we pick through some of those specific scenarios today. Yeah, I guess with him going over there, um, when, when Craig McRae was first appointed coach, it was almost like a clean slate. What he's done in the past is irrelevant. What he does here moving forward. So... With him being allowed to go over there, I reckon that's just a sign of, of Craig showing his support and his trust to, to Jordan, saying, look, mate, we trust you to go over there, um, do the right thing. Uh, that's that's why I think he was allowed to go. Uh, a lot of a lot of players a lot of players asked to go overseas and a lot, a lot aren't allowed. I know that back in our day, Clarko put the hammer down on a few players who, who were keen to go uh, overseas in, during their break. A couple were allowed to go, of course, but um, I, th- I think that's why the permission was, was given, um, just to show him that he has trusted him. He's been pretty good this year for him so far. Um, 
But I guess the next phase of it, as you said, is the leadership group. And if I looked at it from a leader handling this issue, I, from what I've seen with the vision and what I've heard, I don't think they can do anything because, for, for first of all, they're allowed him to go overseas. You, clearly, a lot of all the players are going to drink during their break. There was no issues over there which came back from police or anything like that. The, the girl who was in the vision with him, they looked like they were pretty cosy, pretty friendly throughout most of the night. Um, so as far as the least, you were having a leg to stand on. The, all they could say is as far as from an image base, uh, image base, next time our break comes, you're not going overseas. Because whether he goes to Sydney, to WA, to Brisbane, to Bali, to America, he's going to go and have drinks and, and enjoy himself as a lot of the other players do this time of year. So from a leadership, because there's been no concerns or no reports sent back that he's done the wrong thing by anyone, I don't think they can they can really do anything apart from have the chat of make sure you pick and choose your times, mate. Jordan, I guess Jordan needs to come to the decision where he goes, he can't keep doing this. Um, and yes, he went across and he did, in his eyes, he's done nothing wrong. But as far as, if soon, as soon as you go to Bali or as soon as you go to Vegas or as soon as you go to LA, it, it automatically thinks you're going there on a party scene where a lot of people talk about the break is there to recover. Uh, and, and refresh for the second part of the year. He he knows that he's, people are, are going to have him on watch. Whether he goes to the local footy or, or to anywhere, people are going to be videoing him to see if he's having a beer or having or, or if he's out party going to nightclubs. So he's just got to have an understanding now that he can't do anything without the spotlight being on him because people want to take videos, people want to take photos of him and say, I caught him doing this and try and sell it off or, or whatever they want to do just to get a bit of credit for it. So I think at some stage, and everyone gets to it, some players earlier than than others at 22, 23 might say, look, I need to pull my head in. I was a little bit later, probably the same as Jordan, where you need to, 27, 28, you need to be a bit smarter where you go out, have friends around for drinks, don't go out to, to public places. Um, I think the, the flow on from that is his contract issue. That that's He's done nothing good for his contract issue right now as far as other teams. And yes, I, I understand people are out there saying he did nothing wrong. 100%. If, if there's been no reports back from police and all that or over in Bali, but what teams look at, where there's where there's smoke, there's fire. And when he went across last year in in America, got arrested, and that all um, was was wiped away because of the story come back. And we, I think everyone jumped um, the thoughts on what actually happened. But teams are going to be looking at going no matter where, whether it's an off season, whether it's a split round, can we trust this guy to go away and just be quiet and have a have a restful week and, and not get in trouble and not getting videoed out in the out in the source and, and enjoying himself? But that's that's the issue for him. I think for Collingwood, they they're sitting there going well we probably don't have to pay him as much because teams aren't going to be throwing money at him because of that smoke fire issue. And they'll be hesitant to throw a lot of money at someone who may come across with uh, a reputation of going out and, and finding himself in trouble, whether it's his fault or not, or whether it's just a random person who's videotaping him over in Bali. That's a big concern for clubs when they try and bring a high price person into their football club. So has he breached, has he lost his clean slate with the coach? Has he squandered that? I think that would be for Craig and him to when they when they sat down and say what do you what do you want to get out of going over there? Um, I guarantee you they knew he would have drank over there. Everyone, if if you go into a split round, I reckon there'll be ninety five percent of players would drink. And as I said, whether it's in Australia, whether it's go back to your local club or it's gone to Bali, it's just the fact that what he ha- what happened to him last year, and then the bar it's it's more almost more the Bali scene. As soon as you hear that, it's it's the party scene. He's gone over there just to get drunk and have a good time, which he, he may have been. But I don't think he's crossed any rules from what I've seen. And as I said, I, I'm not above this. If there's quite a story going around that I haven't heard, but from what I've heard and seen through the media, I don't think he's broken any rules that other players wouldn't have done when they've gone on their break. That other blokes would have gone to parties. They would have been filmed um, with, with girls. Um, so, yeah, he's he, he was at a bar, got videoed and got sent back. And it was just because of who he was is why this has become an issue. What do you think the board's view would be, Luke, from your knowledge of football clubs? So Collingwood's, uh, you, you say he's done nothing wrong. He's on the front page of the paper multiple days. It is an embarrassment to the club. And if there yeah. was the understanding that uh, that he could go, I can't imagine that it was okay. Well, if we'll wear, if it ends up on the front page of the Herald Sun for three days, we'll wear that. But you also have to understand that it's Collingwood. You also have to understand that it's Jordan. And it, as soon as something happens like that, it's going to get put on the paper. If if he was having a beer back at his hometown in the pub at two o'clock dancing with a girl, would that have been an issue? 
It would have been less sorry, of an I issue. Sorry, that was a question. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But, yeah, no, so that's, that's what I'm saying. If, if he went home and had a beer in the pub and was dancing with a, with a girl in the pub back home, would that have been his big issue just because he was in Bali? So you sort of look at the football club and go, well, if you let him go over there and he's getting filmed at a nightclub having a few drinks dancing, what else do you think he's going to do over there? So you, you sort of know that Collingwood are a big club and everyone, Collingwood's always in the paper because of the club that they are and everyone wants to write about him. Jordan's the topic of discussion because of what happened last off-season. He's had history with, obviously, the, the dog biting his hand or, or whatever happened there. Um, and then you've got... And then you've got his contract coming up. So they, they, w- they would have known that if video had to come out, it would have been a topic. It would have been an issue because of who he is and what the club is. So they sort of sit back and it's, it's not great. You never want in the off-season, you never want to have meetings and, and that your clubs want to go under the radar. Less, less media, the better. But unfortunately for Collingwood, because of who they are, they're always going to get their, mates, their players put on the, on the back page. So what do you expect will come of this as it's dealt with today? From all it would be is would be discussions to Jordan about putting yourself in a position not to get filmed, and yes, and that hundred percent, he's still a young fella, he's still living his life, but maybe make a decision on where you go next break, where you go in the off season. Don't go to places where you know there's going to be a thousand cameras waiting for you to make one little slip up, and then because you know it's going to get sent straight back to to Melbourne, straight into the papers, straight into the TV. Um, that's what the discussion will be with him. I, I don't think they can punish him because unless they've given him strict guidelines that you weren't allowed to go to a nightclub or weren't allowed to drink he hasn't done anything for them to sort of come down really hard apart from bring a bit of media attention to the football club unwanted media attention but that wasn't really his fault he was doing what everyone else did but it was just someone filmed him and, and sent it back to the papers I think I, he was the the filmings happened within his group and then it's posted on Instagram Instagram so it's not quite it, it's not quite as um so that idea of the persecution that Dugowie is pushing, that's not quite it. He wasn't being followed by someone with a camera and then it was sent back and sold in an attempt to embarrass him or undermine him. This this is largely, uh, if not of his own hand, then within his own circle. But I think that's today's, that's today's generation though, isn't it? Every you, you, you haven't been somewhere if you haven't taken a video or put it on Instagram or Snapchat. Uh, I think that's what people have to do now. If... If you didn't, if you went to Bali and didn't post something, then who said you were ever there? <laughs> that's, that's the cool thing to do, apparently. Um, I don't know. I, I, I find that they, they they may say next time he comes and says, "Can I go overseas?" They might be maybe not, maybe stay a bit more low key. But as far as from, from a club point of view, yeah, the, they didn't want the attention, but he hasn't done anything wrong. Um, would that? Yeah, my, my my biggest thing is. They may not let him go next time, but as far as what he's done wrong, nothing. So they can't really sit back and slap him over the hands and say, you're a naughty boy. He was out there doing whatever other player's done, but apart from because he's a big personality, he's been in trouble in the past, it was a story and because of the club he plays for. That, that's my point of view. And people probably saying I'm totally wrong, and I know probably Kane Corns is sitting at home going, you're an idiot with how, how you're handling this. But from the information I've given, that's how I would handle yeah, it as so a, as a leadership. This group. is split right down the middle. There's half who yep. hold your view and half who hold the other view, which is why I think it makes it such an interesting issue for oh. Collingwood. I suspect within Collingwood there are those two views as well and what level of culpability they accept for it. Without a doubt. And that, that's the thing. If it was Scotty Pendlebury over there doing it and it was sent back, people would go, oh, about time Scotty's letting his hair down. He's actually can go and have a beer. It's because of who it was. And the the big discussion, as I said before, it's going to be mentioned to Jordan about he just needs to be a bit more smart with where he goes on holidays and, and who he's around. Does he um, need to be a bit more dedicated to his professional football career? I, 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 I don't know him well enough. I don't know what he's, what he's diet likes and all that kind of stuff. If you look from afar, but... If you look from afar, it looks like he goes and enjoys himself, but that's that's a perception from 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 afar. Like you, you you just don't know. It's it's to the people internal that have to have that conversation with if, if they don't think they're they're working hard enough. I remember Gary Ablett. Geelong had that internal discussion with him, and he came on won the Brownlow a couple of years later because they hit him up and said you need to get better in this area, and he went away and worked on it. That didn't come from outside because no one knew that how he trained. Um, it wasn't until his teammates in the club actually spoke to him about it where he took that next step. And I'm not sure if Jordan's had that discussion with the club, but I don't think he's going to listen to anyone from outside the footy club. It's got to be his teammates in his club if they think he's not dedicated enough. The period of enlightenment. So how does that happen? Who do you need 
around you, Luke, to, to get there for the level of self-awareness to understand your scenario as you as you walk through life and then your and then your uh, commitment to your um, to your football career is he he has a relative who's his manager now I think we would be of the understanding that he had a previous manager who was prepared to challenge him and and speak about boundaries and he um, he removed himself from that setup and and found something different what, what, what do you need to find your way? I guess it's someone who he trusts that they need to explain to him that look at it from a different point of view. Because Jordan's sitting there going, I went overseas, I did nothing wrong, and I was in the paper. They're after me, they're chasing me. Uh, and that's his mindset at the moment. He needs someone around him who who needs to point out the other side of it, saying, if you don't put yourself in that situation, this isn't going to happen. So it's it's amazing. People always talk about mentors on the football field to help you get better and help you play the best football you can and you get former players in to do that. I, I find for someone like Jordan, a mentor off the footy field who he trusts, who he relies on and they can have that tough conversation to sort of point things out to him. That is just as important as someone who helps him on fo- on the football field because if they can straighten that side of him up, then it's going to impact in a positive way on the footy field. So it's almost for him to go and find that person who we can rely on and you almost got to give them permission to tell you the tough love, give you the tough love and tell you the truth. Hodgy, the curiosity of a full-on shootout on Saturday night between the Giants and the Bulldogs, which allowed Toby Green to kick five goals and Cody Waitman, who's got claims to being a future Toby Green, he kicked five goals. Oh, the um, How exciting was it um, to see, to have for both Green and... Um, and Waitman to have three in the first quarter. Just the zippy ball movement back and forth. And I, I don't think a lot of clubs would like that because they don't like goals getting scored so easily against them. But the way the doggies play with that link-up handball, move the ball quick, try and get the out number, uh, and have that open forward line. But then GWS, is, they're, they're exciting at the moment. They're um, obviously with the change of coach. And we see it all the time. When Carlton, when Teague replaced Bolton at Carlton, they had that freedom to move forward. Um, that's what we're seeing from GWS. So, look, I think we sit back and go, well, I think it was the highest scoring game for the year. Sit back and go, why can't we have more of those? Because, <laughs> um, I tell you what, it was entertaining. And I think it shows it shows the skill level of the players as well. Um, when you move the ball quick, you, the, the small forwards, um, you actually see the ability of what they're able to do before teams can flood back. So it's it's an exciting, but unfortunately, I don't think getting towards the end of the final, getting towards the finals, the team's going to, be backing that mode rather than the, the defensive structure as they normally lean towards. Yeah, so to the finals. that's the luxury of the caretaker coach is if yep. if Mark McVeigh gets that job for real, uh, he wouldn't set them up in such a way to, never mind the score 100 points, but to the concede 100 points. Yeah, and I think that's one because media look back and go, who's a good defence? You, you can't have a bad defence and finish top four and that all... That's what coaches start thinking about because, you know, you know it's like, as soon as coaches get under pressure from the media, you start to panic and, and you can't give scores away. But I guess GWS at the moment are sitting there going, let's just play. We've got an, we've got an, ex- an exciting list who can move the ball, can score quickly. Um, Toby Green, he's sitting down there, get the ball to him as quick as you can. But I can tell you, I've spoken to a lot of people who sat back and could not stop watching that game just because, <laughs> it was yes, it was a split round. We, we've had less games of footy on, but they really enjoyed that game of football. Seven goals for Green. I think I might have said five. Seven for Green and five for Waitman. The pressure index, so St Kilda have bought themselves the place here. Uh, they missed the critical win. So huge pressure now on their next four. Sydney, Carlton, Fremantle and the Bulldogs. That's yep. not St Kilda. That's not the way they've played this year. But it is, it's a big missing four points that has them slide to eighth. Yeah. yeah. Look, you feel for them. Because I spoke earlier in the show about I watched that team try everything they possibly could against St Kilda with two rotations for the last quarter. And unfortunately, they, they come up against a team in, in Essendon who had a point to prove, who tweaked their game style. Um, and you could just see that St Kilda were flat. So after such a good start for that football club, they've, they've got a, a, a tough run coming up. But we're going we're gonna to see what they're made of. Um, you still look forward. And, and that forward line, I still like it. King, Membry, then you've got Paddy Ryder or Marshall resting down there. If they can do the same as what GWS can do and take a few more risks and get the ball into the forward line quicker, um, they, they can hurt any team on their day. Do they go ahead and finish the Brett Ratton contract extension now as they were going to? Yeah. Yeah, I've got, I got no doubt. If you, You've seen what... 
you see how he is with the players. And we talk about coaches, they're, they're managers just as much as coaches. He's clearly got the understanding. He's got a football brain, which is there's no doubt if you talk to him about football for two seconds. Um, but it's also the care that he has for, for the players. And I think in today's game, that's just as important as, as anything. So um, I would, just because they've dropped a couple um, and they've got a tough run home, I wouldn't be holding off the contract for that. I'd be I'd be signing him up. And so at least that way, the whole kind knows exactly where they're going. Do you still expect them to make the finals? Yes, yes, I do. Oh, they're they're sitting along that they're sitting on that uh, on that borderline. But as as we sort of said at the start of the show, this is such an exciting year. How often do we get to this stage and you're um and ah, and you could have ticks and crosses against all teams of why they should and shouldn't, should or shouldn't. But I think they'll get Steel back in, uh, and he makes a massive difference. They've been able to play a certain brand with without him, but the last couple of games, I reckon, you can see the difference what Steel would make to that football side. So you get him back in the mix. Um, and I'm, I'm still confident they'll make the finals. The, pre- the um, preliminary final integrity is where we measure a team for what they're doing and how will that look on the penultimate weekend of the season. And Sydney are here. I, that, they have been the hardest team to peg, I, I think, all year. They have had performances that would indicate that their time could be now. And they've had performances which suggest that they are their work in progress and maybe it's next year or the year after. The third quarter was really disappointing. Port Adelaide are dead honest, so they make you earn it, but they were significantly undermanned. There was the Laddam stuff, which was some players excel against their old team, some lose their minds. He seemed to fall into the latter category. How are we to assess Sydney from a, from that high-end perspective? I think the way... Sydney are a very exciting team when they play. Like they've They've changed away from their stoppage, get numbers around, big bulky, and they've, that's why the Joshy Kennedy was put out to the wing, um, so they could have some bit more speed through the middle, and they, they want to keep the ball alive. They want a, a chaos style of football, keep knocking it on, keep it going. The old Sydney was all about stoppages, and, and that was finals football kind of, kind of style. Um, the biggest issue when you go for that free-flowing, lively, get the ball moving up, up your end quickly is sometimes it can reverse and go the other way. And they've had patches where they've kicked a lot of goals against them. Uh, round 10, the Blues kicked six in a row against them. Round 11, the Tigers kicked seven. Round 12, Melbourne kicked five. And then the Power kicked seven uh, on the weekend. And you look through that third quarter patch that you spoke about. The uh, Port were plus five in clearances. They had 17 inside 50s to eight. And at one stage, they had 12 to zero with six goals in a row. You can't, You cannot do that. If you want to play finals football in today's game. And then on the flip side, they don't, they won all the hard stuff, but then Port Adelaide were 31 uncontested possessions up on, on the Swan. So you sort of sit back and go, if, if Sydney are going to reach into the finals and they're going to make a dint in the finals this year, they can't let teams get on a run. They need at some stage to shut the game down, get multiple stoppages, take a little bit of life out of it. And I think that's the maturity. They've introduced a lot of younger players over the next over the last couple of years. And it's all about learning the game and maturing on when to go fast and when to just to slow it up a little bit. How absolutely perfect that Sydney and St Kilda would play on Saturday night coming off those performances. I think it's going to be a pretty heated game. I reckon both St Kilda, you could sort of see how devastated they were post-game. Uh, and Sydney, well, Sydney's not a team where they're going to put up two bad performances like that two weeks in a row. So I tell you what, it's going to be a, um, a big game Saturday night, but you just want to see how much how much teams will want it. St Kilda have to bounce back um, after the last couple of weeks. Um, and Sydney's pride, we, we, we know how they're going to respond as well. The loser will likely concede their place in the eight. That's how high stakes that's going to be. So that, that's why this round just sets up so perfectly.